who's the author of three popular fishing books um, and very much a, an advocate of Chesapeake Bay protection and restoration and tells way better fishing stories than I do. Um, and hopefully we'll hear some today. We have Robbie Savage, who began her environmental career in 1973 at the relatively newly created EPA. Um, I've known Robbie for quite a while. And there is no one I know who knows the Clean Water Act any better than Robbie. Um, mm -hmm. So really glad that Robbie's joining us. And Bobby White's Carver, who's a beef cattle farmer in Swope, Virginia. And I think anybody who knows Swope knows Bobby because uh, there's quite a sense of place in Bobby's writings. Um, the Swope Almanac um, is an award-winning book and we're often getting lots of uh, email updates from Swope about what's going on and they're, they're just great, great insights, great sense of place. Um, Bobby's a, a great advocate for, for the Bay and um, clean water throughout the whole watershed. So I'm going to kick off by reading, since I'm a codger too, and I actually have a newspaper here, I'm just going to read a little paragraph from today's Washington Post about Earth Day. 50 years ago, flames sprang from the oil slick surface of a Cleveland River, which was the Cuyahoga. Uh, smog choked Los Angeles, pesticides silenced millions of insects and birds, oil gushed from a busted well off California, swamping everything that lived in the ocean. Then on April 22nd, 1970, 10% of America took to the streets for the first Earth Day. So that was mostly the part that just, just kind of woke me up a little bit this morning. 10% of Americans, it was like 20 million Americans hit the streets back in 1970, um, which is really pretty incredible. So I'm gonna, we're gonna do this. Um, we're gonna hear from Sean, Robbie, and Bobby about 15 minutes each, and then we're gonna um, take questions at the end and try and get a dialogue going. There is a chat box here, so if you at some point have some questions or anything you wanna bring up, put it in the chat, bo chat box and we'll try and get to that at the end. So I am gonna turn it over to Sean, so Sean, Thank you very much and welcome and you're on. Thank you very much, Peter. I appreciate it. And thank you for agreeing to host us today. Uh, it's, uh, that's also much appreciated. It's such an honor uh, to be here with, uh, with Robbie and Bobby, who are two of my environmental heroes, certainly. And uh, looking across the list of names that are on the call here, there's uh, certainly some movers and shakers uh, all and uh in chesapeake bay environmentalism and uh and i really appreciate everybody coming on and i appreciate you inviting me to to come in and talk i uh i don't remember the first earth day i wasn't aware that it was an earth day uh at the time i was 10 years old uh, I, I grew up in rural east tennessee uh and um uh, as the son of a church of christ minister who was also a fisherman and we had uh we had a boat dock at the time i lived on a houseboat in the boat dock and uh let me see if i my screen share will work here can you see that is it working yes <laughs> okay so so this is me at, at our own earth day or at least in 1970 <laughs> and then so i'd already started fishing i am a i am a fisherman uh, recreationally, mostly, I, uh, I did commercial fish at one time, put myself through college uh, running trot lines for blue catfish. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, I sometimes think that uh, there's a place for that now on the Potomac, some of the other rivers, that because uh, at least the invasive blue catfish have kind of, uh, they've kind of, uh, uh, taken over, but uh, but I, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, first of all, I'll let you know a little bit about my history. So, uh, so the TVA lakes where I grew up, uh, were, this was back, you know, Works Progress Administration, the Roosevelt Era New Deal uh, thing, where it seemed like a good idea at the time to bring uh, hydroelectricity into the rural parts of North America and especially in the southeast. So they dammed up all the rivers and streams and uh, uh, it p displaced a whole lot of people in the process. But, you know, I guess uh, it was it was said to be progress. Uh, so, you know, I, I grew up on one of those uh, fishing and hunting, doing all the outdoors things you can do and, and really enjoyed it. Uh, my first uh, introduction to environmentalism came about 1976. I turned 16 years old, got my driver's license, and I heard about 
a project that the Tennessee Valley Authority had started called Teleco Dam. And the idea was to dam up the uh, Little Tennessee River, which was arguably one of the prettiest rivers in the state. And, um, and to, uh, to turn it into, uh, you know, another lake. And so it, that didn't make sense to me since it's such a pretty area and it was a place where we trout stream. So I, you know, like I said, I, I got in my 63 Falcon and with my best friend and we headed down to Knoxville, Tennessee and we protested the building of Teleco Dam. Uh, and, you know, that's, uh, that, that was such a uh, life changing life altering experience for me because I realized that I had a whole lot in common with the people that were there who were doing the same thing that that I was doing uh, in that protest and, um, uh, and, and by the way it's the first time I ever heard uh, John Prine uh, John Prime wasn't there, but uh, his uh, his song Paradise was being blared over the loudspeakers because it was kind of an environmental anthem at the time, uh, and uh, and and so uh, it, you know it's funny when you have music in common with people, you have a whole lot of stuff in common with them, and it's so sad that we lost John Prime a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but uh, then along came um, let me get back to the share screen here, and along came. Um, there, it's working. Along came this little fish called a snail darter. Well, the snail darter was discovered in the Little Tennessee River, and uh, it turns out that's about the only place it lives. Uh, so uh, they turned this into a, a big environmental case. It was the first test of the Environmental Protection Act. Uh, it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court actually ruled in favor of the fish. Well, they didn't, we didn't win uh, because uh, eventually, uh, one of my friends there with a t-shirt, uh, because uh, eventually Congress, thanks to uh, Harold ba Howard Baker and uh, Jimmy Duncan, passed a law that exempted the Little Tennessee River system from the, uh, uh, from the Environmental Protection Act and they got their dam after all. Uh, so anyway, the, the Brown houseboat there is where I, where, uh, I first lived when I uh, first got married. Uh, and that's the, the uh, boat dock that my dad and I, uh, that my dad and I ran. My first job was working at that boat dock, docking boats. Um, so uh, fast forward through, uh, through college and uh, 10 years in the military, and uh, here I am on the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, I had no idea that one of these, you know, one day back, back then I had no idea that I would be, you know, getting to do radio interviews and magazine articles and occasionally TV spots uh, to talk about fishing. Uh, and you know, it's kind of interesting because fishermen have a unique perspective on clean water. We see it at the ground level, you know, we're right there at it. And I, and I know we all do because we all get out and we love to enjoy the bay and the tributaries. But, but when you're a fisherman, you're right there with it. You're close. You see the trash on the ground. You see the tires that somebody threw out. Um, and, and you see the mistakes that were made. For example, back uh, somebody had a great idea to build artificial reefs with tires back when I was a kid. And uh, well, that, that, that didn't work. And they ended up having to spend a whole lot of money to take all those out. Uh, but uh, but you see it firsthand, and you see, you get you learn a appreciation for the beauty that's out above Park City, Utah, where I'm fishing there in one of the lakes uh, up in the mountains there, and and you see it at its best, and you see it at its worst, uh, and when it's at its worst, it's really bad, uh, and uh, and you know I don't think this uh, this picture is here is uh, somewhere up farther south, but uh, but we have some streams around here that are just as bad. Uh, and one of the things that attracted me to the Alliance, and I'm a board member for the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, uh, is their work with, cl with clean water, with uh, uh, Project Clean Stream and uh, some of the other water quality monitoring uh, initiatives that they do to you know, try to keep up with, uh, with what's going on out there and to help clean things up. And we've made progress, and I wanted to tell you just briefly before I wrap up here about a story. Uh, and, uh, you know, especially in you know, the last 10 years or so, things have changed quite a bit. In my book, in my last book, Chesapeake Panfish, How to Catch Chesapeake Panfish, I wrote a chapter about gudgeon fishing. Have you ever heard of a gudgeon? So uh, a gudgeon is uh, a little minnow about that long. Uh, well, you can't see me. Uh, a little minnow that, uh, that used to be pretty prolific around in this part of the country. So... Um, Back during the 1930s and 1940s, 
gudgeon fishing was so popular that uh, the kids would get out of school. They'd let school out and they'd line up on the, on the river banks and the stream banks, usually with just a stick or a cane pole and a piece of thread and a little tiny hook or even a safety pin bent into a hook uh, with a piece of bread or maybe a piece of worm uh, and, and catch gudgeons. Well, what they, then they have a big pot of rendered lard on the side of the, uh, side of the creek and they, they would clean them and fry them up. Now, this, these little things were, you know, tiny, just about the size of your finger. Uh, and so it would take literally thousands to feed all the people that were out there fishing for them. But that was so popular that they would actually put uh, signs and placards up in the post office and the banks and stuff, just so everyone would know that, uh, that it was going on and, and they could let school out. And everybody, all the kids could get out there, not just kids, but adults. This is my friend, Ted Corcoran. Uh, Ted Corcoran's family fished for gudgeons uh, uh, many years ago. So what happened uh, to the gudgeons? Well, after about 1940, up until about 1945, they disappeared, they were gone. The people stopped fishing for them, there was no point. Uh, and the problem was the water was just too dirty. Uh, there was no point to fish for them anymore because they weren't there. Um, but uh, about five years ago, things changed. So Ted uh, says he was driving over the Little Gunpowder River. When, that's where that is. That's Route 40 Bridge, uh, Route 40 Bridge just above Baltimore uh, in that picture there. And uh, he said he decided to go down and see if there was any shad in the river. And he got down there and he noticed thousands of gudgeons. And he just couldn't believe it. And he said he got so excited that he, he started catching them. He didn't have anything to put them in. So he took off his shoes and he loaded up his socks with minnows. <laughs> and, uh, and he took them home and uh, fried them up. And, and so I heard about this and uh, I asked Ted to, uh, to take me gudgeon fishing and he did. And that's where I got these pictures. Uh, and, uh, and so we caught some and I brought them home and fried them up and uh, they, they're delicious. I, you know, all you do is cut your heads off, the scales just fall off, cut their heads off, the scales just fall off of them and, uh, uh, and uh, gut them and fry them and you eat them bones and all. And you wouldn't think they're that good, but they absolutely are delicious. And the reason I'm telling you that story is because this is all because of clean water. There was no restoration effort for gudgeons. Uh, there was no uh, restocking of the streams. Uh, none of that happened. The only thing that happened is we had an improvement in our water quality and the fish came back. And you know what, I, I fished yesterday for a little while over at uh, Red Bridges on the Chop Tank River. There were thousands of gudgeons in there. And just about every stream that I visit now, uh, I see them and people write to me, people who brought my book, they write to me and they say, hey, we saw gudgeons, we, we see what's going on, we see what you're talking about now. Uh, they're actually out there and I said, did you try to eat them? And some people have. So I don't know if, if uh, the gudgeon feast on the side of the streams will come back or not, but I hope it does. Uh, you know, in all my books, I sum up the, uh, the books with a, 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 um, a chapter about environmental advocacy and hoping to encourage fishermen uh, to, to do more. You know, a lot of the trash that we see on the stream banks, frankly, is left there by fishermen. Um, but, uh, you know, I hope we're making some progress in that. Uh, I told you earlier, my dad was the Church of Christ minister, and uh, I'm not a real religious person anymore, but I still remember a book in, I mean, a, a verse in Mark that he used to quote that says, to whom much is given, much is expected. And, and there's nothing more true about that. I mean, I love to fish the Chesapeake Bay and get out there and enjoy the, uh, uh, all the bounty that the bay gives us and, and not just the bay, but the streams and the tributaries throughout the watershed. Uh, and we are given a lot. And as a result, it comes with great responsibility. And, uh, uh, you know, I think my generation made a little bit of a difference, but there's a whole long way to go and we've got, uh, got a long way to go. And so the next generation coming up, you know, you got your work cut out for you. I think that's about all I have, Peter. Thank you, Sean, appreciate that. Um, at some point after this too, I wanna to pick your brain about how to catch gudgeons. Cause that's okay. <laughs> now been added to my list that was never on it before. Um, I'm gonna turn this over to, to Robbie Savage. So Robbie, you're on. Um, Robbie, unmute. Need lower left on your screen. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Take it away. 
Hold on a minute. Am I unmuted? No. You're unmuted. Yep, we hear you. Okay, cool. Um, one of the things that happens when you retire is that you're not up on all the um, uh, technology. So please forgive me. So I want to. I want to. I'm missing a thing. Today. What? You're not missing a thing. Oh, okay, good. Okay. So I want to follow on uh, what Sean just said because, um, as I said, I, I retired um, last year, and it is so heartening for me to know that there is the next generation that is picking up the, the mantle and you've got, um, it's been very difficult for those of us, like Peter said, we, you know, we've been in this field a really long time and to see what's happening and, and so many of the accomplishments that were made are being taken apart. So um, you're not just gonna have to pick up the mantle, you're gonna have to do a lot of repair work and I'm sorry about that, but um, that's life. So moving on, I started um, in the most unusual, circuitous way. Um, and most women of my generation, and I'm obviously older than Sean because I do remember Earth Day. Um, but we, you know, we had to start at either typist or whatever. So um, you can move to the next one. Thank you for doing that, Drew. I grew up in uh, Long Beach, California. My mother always called me a water baby. Um, I was the typical, if you've ever seen the movie Gidget, I was the one in the water when all the other girls were looking gorgeous on the beach. Um, and it was always part of my life as a, uh, you know, as a teenager, I went there to cry over a boyfriend or whatever. It was always the place, my spiritual place. And, and still, obviously still is. So, um, while many were in the streets for the Vietnam War and for uh, the environment, and as Peter said, 10% of the American population was out demonstrating for cleaner air and water and the pesticides that came with uh, to awareness because of Rachel Carson's book, I was at home with my second child. And so instead of demonstrating in the streets, I made the commitment to share my love of water with my family. So uh, this is a couple of them. I have eight grandchildren. These are three of them. Uh, and the one in the middle, we were doing a cleanup along the Rivanna River. He was about 10. And he found this huge battery. Uh, and it was a, like a, uh, from a semi or whatnot. And he threw up his hands and said, Grandma, what are these people thinking? And I knew that I had done at least a fair job of bringing the children uh, to a place where they would love and protect the environment as much as I do. Moving on. So um, even with this love of water, um, I didn't have a clue about how I would get into an environmental field, didn't even think of it. I thought I was gonna be a stay-at-home mom like most people of my generation were. But then my former husband was, uh, selected to be one of 10 in the very first management intern class at the newly created EPA. So off we moved from uh, the West Coast to Washington, DC. And um, I'll deviate from that. It, um, it started, uh, it's a quick story, but I was not a typist. But in my day, that's where you had to start in just about everything, coffee and getting the coffee and uh, doing the typing. But I wasn't very good at it. So I took the test over and over and over and I failed it by one letter here, one letter there. Um, this one lady picked up somebody else's test and she said, anybody that tries this hard deserves to pass. So that's how I began my environmental career by a very kind woman saying, if you care this much, you know, I'm, I'm gonna let you go forward. And so I started in the office of solid waste and then moved to the office of water where I spent a number of years in the 208 area-wide program, which is now considered watershed protection. Back then it was uh, 208. Okay, moving on. Um, and then I was very fortunate to have uh, a woman, which some of you may know, her name is Jean Packard. She said, what are you doing being a typist? Do you know about this? You care about this? And so she helped me get a job at the League of Women Voters in the, uh, as a water quality specialist. 
So that's when I made the leap from um, being the coffee and the, and the typist to um, a professional position, which I, she passed a couple of years ago. Uh, she was Board of Supervisors of Fairfax County and kind of my leading star in the environmental field uh, for all of, all of my life that, uh, that I knew her. So then I decided I wanted to learn about industry. So I knew about how EPA worked um, for the most part. And I knew about how a nonprofit worked for the most part, but I didn't understand how industry worked. So uh, it was not the most enjoyable job I ever had, but I went to the National Association of Manufacturers as um, an environmental specialist. And it was um, insightful and something that I'm glad I did. I would never do it again. Moving on. So then um, I was asked to head the Association of State and Interstate Water Agencies. And um, I was the first director. I was there 28 years and had the opportunity to work on the um, uh, before that with the league, the 77, the 81, and the 87 amendments to the Clean Water Act, and to um, work with Congress, but also other organizations, which sadly we're not seeing. And Sean, you mentioned Mr. Baker. Um, he was very helpful to me. I'm sorry he got that exemption for, for you, but he was very helpful in, um, in a number of the legislative proposals working with Mr. Muskie and, and um, Mr. Baker and some others in the 72 Clean Water Act. So um, it was a great opportunity and where I met Peter for the first time about 100 years ago. Let's go, next one. So um, I was fortunate to have a fairly strong and long relationship with the leadership at EPA as well as the governors and the 50 states. So I thought, well, hey, um, let's do a commemoration of the anniversary of the Clean Water Act of 1992, and then again in 2002. And as part of that, President Carter uh, hosted the World Water Summit at the Carter Center, which was wonderful um, to, to get to know someone who didn't need notes. He just knew what was going on environmentally around the world, and it was, uh, such a gift that, um, that he gave to me and still does every time I, I hear him talk. Um, so in 2002, we created National Water Monitoring Day. And uh, then in 2003, we expanded it to be World Water Monitoring Day. And as I moved here to Charlottesville, which is where I am now, uh, Philippe Cousteau and his Earth uh, Echo organization has taken it over and the administration is wonderful and um, it has absolutely <laughs> the dreams and hopes that I ever, um, even in my wildest dreams. So millions of children, uh, hundreds of countries are participating, which is in my view what we're gonna need, uh, that kind of international cooperation if we're gonna get uh, environmental protection back on the, on the front stage instead of, um, at least in our country, way, way back. But don't you think it's interesting that as we've all been in lockdown, um, the environment is getting so much better. And I hope that shares with the Congress and the administration and local elected officials and whatnot, what can be done if we limit uh, the insults to our, um, uh, to our national and international environment. So um, that's one of my, my babies. I'm delighted that, that uh, Philippe is taking it on and making such a wonderful success about it. Yes, and for all of you who have participated in World Water Monitoring Day, thank you. Moving on, um, at the end of 2006, so now I've been working for um, a federal government agency, then I went to a nonprofit agency, then I went to a uh, business Association, and then I went to work for uh, the states. Um, and then I came to Charlottesville because I'd not worked at the local level. Um, and when you work in Washington, you, your head gets a little screwed up, I will have to say. You tend to think that the joke about Washington being an island surrounded by reality is, 
really not true, but it is. And um, so moving here to Charlottesville, I noticed a number of things. One is I could do something right on the ground. I could, I talked about it, you know, I lobbied for clean water. I did a lot of, wrote a lot of regs, legislation, but I didn't do the in the ground with the local population kind of work. So I was hired by the Ravenna Conservation Society back at the end of 2006, and I became immediately a member of the Choose Clean Water Coalition, uh, which was, if, if you're not an overly active member, I would encourage you to be one. You get lots more out of being uh, a Choose Clean Water member and the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay than you give, uh, especially if you're running a nonprofit. So moving on, um, fortunately, um, in 2016, in Charlottesville, we had two um, environmental organizations. One was more watershed, cleanups, um, protections, paddles, that sort of thing. Lots of education, children's programs, which I always love. And then there was a group called Streamwatch, which was the premier uh, level three benthic water quality monitoring. Um, and for years, there was a sense we should merge, we shouldn't, we should, yes, we should. Well, they got some new leadership and um, asked me to come over and chat with them. And the two parties agreed that we should merge. And so we became, the next one, the Ravana Conservation Alliance. And um, the only nonprofit, uh, one of the things I wanted to do was get our bacteria program uh, to a level three, as well as the benthic program. And unless you tell me different, Peter, I think we're still, Ribana is the only um, watershed group that has both benthic and bacteria at a level three, the highest level of monitoring. For sounds right to me. Hmm? Okay, sounds, sounds good. Right. Okay. So um, when we merged, um, I said I would, I would continue, well, the other guy from the other organization was going to be the director and I was going to retire, but he got a better offer and uh, went to work for Albemarle County. So I said, I will do it for three more years, but that 70 is plenty and um, I, I'll go volunteer somewhere. So that's what I did. And um, I am now volunteering at UVA Children's Hospital in the uh, pediatric intensive care, something I've always wanted to do. And um, I can, it's interesting that the environment and um, the protection of the environment, particularly water for little kids, I can read to them and sing to them and bring them books about water and rivers and oceans. And so I haven't left my environmental roots behind. I'm just transitioning it into a new, uh, a new venue. And there are more slides for anyone who's interested about the beginnings of the Clean Water Act and um, the Environmental Protection Agency. I will tell you one more, um, one more an anecdotal story. Um, when um, EPA was created, yes, there was tremendous pressure by the public. Yes, there was Rachel Carson. But there was also something that seems re more relevant now than it did to me at the time. And that is that Nixon was running against Ed Muskie for president. And so uh, one of the things, of course, that Ed Muskie was known for was being chairman of the Senate Environment Committee. So the uh, Nixon administration thought, hey, what better than to acquiesce to the local public pressure and to create this agency as an independent agency. It's not cabinet. So it doesn't have the standing that most other agencies have. And to be honest, I'm worried that if someone gets another term, um, executive orders can easily be overturned. So those of you who are younger, please pay attention to that. Um, we always say, he'll never do this, he'll never do that. And taking EPA out of existence uh, would be a fear that I have. Um, but anyway, so um, one of the reasons that Nixon, in addition to all the ones we all know, uh, his motivation was also political to take the under the support away from Mr. Muskie. So when he did that, we got an agency, but we also got Clean Water Act was vetoed, the Air Act was vetoed, the Solid <laughs> Drinking Water Act. All of the legislation that came through there had to be overridden by a presidential veto. Um, and um, 
Clean Water Act particularly seems to be uh, veto bait for a lot of a lot of folks. So um, I thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, it is an, um, a delight to come back and be part of part of you all, at least temporarily. And then I'm going to go back and quarantine and hibernate for as long as our governor. I don't know about the rest of you, but ours says June 10th. So take care. And, um, and Bobby, it's good to see you again. Good to see you too. Robbie, thank you so much. And, and you're always a part of Clean Water Coalition, so don't worry about it. You, you have permanent status. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can go lobby the hill with you, huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. That'd be great. If, if we ever go back to the hill, the lobby, <laughs> however that's going to play out. But um, I'm going to turn it over to Bobby. So Bobby White Carver, you're on. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Can you see the Princess of Swope behind me there? <laughs> <laughs> Greetings. <laughs> the, uh, well, good morning and happy Earth Day 50 to everybody. Uh, the scene behind me is uh, our home in Swope, Virginia. Uh, we're, we're in the headwaters of the South Fork of the Shenandoah River. Uh, let's see here, screen share. Can y'all see that picture? Yes. All right, well, th this is a drone shot of, of our river farm. And you can see the, the, the middle river there with uh, the, the riparian forest buffer. We planted that in 2004. And we're very pleased with the results. We fenced the catalog too in 2004. So in 1970, I was 15, so I'm a little bit older than Sean. Uh, as old as me. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and so in 1970, I was 15, so that makes me eligible for Medicare this year. So, <laughs> <laughs> looking forward to that. Uh, and before I share some stories about, about our, our pilgrimage, if you will, uh, I, I want to say we've come a long way and the streams are cleaner than they were in 1970 and the Chesapeake Bay is healthier. And it is through environmental activism uh, that gets this done. Environmental activism with groups like this and ours is actually the beating heart of a healthier planet. So 50 years ago, we, we had just landed on the moon. And uh, I'm gonna show another picture here. This is, uh, you know, a now famous picture that was taken by the astronauts on Apollo 11 mm -hmm. in 1969. And America was at war in Vietnam, I remember well when Bobby Kennedy and Dr. Martin Luther King were assassinated. We had protests on the war. Uh, and, and I remember when Jane Fonda went to Hanoi and, you know, she became famous as Hanoi Jane. Uh, and you may recall that now she's 82 and has been arrested five times for protesting uh, for the climate crisis. So I really admire her. Uh, and also 50 years ago, Dr. Seuss wrote the Lorax. And who would have thought that the Lorax would be used in a court case recently against the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, the uh, frack gas pipeline. So that's pretty cool. And, and by the way, I use the Lorax uh, in my course at JMU. <laughs> we, we, we read it, the students read that book. 
It's mandatory. I remember the hippies and the flower children. Uh, and, and I remember uh, probably prior to 1970, learning to water ski in Smith Mountain Lake. And my father and his friend made me go overboard in the water. And I remember the tow rope coming by and grabbing onto the tow rope. And I remember seeing banana peels and raw sewage floating by. And that's when I said, hit it, because I didn't want to be in that water. So I learned how to ski in the dirty water. Now, in, in 1980, I went to work for the Soil Conservation Service, which is now the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And in 1980, there were no cost share programs for farmers. Uh, and, and I remember uh, teams of soil scientists going out on, on the land and mapping soils. They would dig holes in the land and analyze the soil and we made uh, published soil surveys. And now all the soils in the country have been mapped and you can download a free app for your phone to let you know what soil is on your land. It's a wonderful resource. And I remember well, uh, in 1985, the uh, Food Security Act, the Farm Bill of 1985. That was the first time in our history that USDA subsidies would be tied to conservation. And I was a lowly uh, field conservationist at that time. And we had the responsibility of uh, analyzing soils and, and determining whether a farmer had wetlands on their farm. And uh, we, we would send a certified letter to these, these farmers saying something like, uh, the federal government has determined that you have wetlands on your farm, and if you want to appeal that, you need to call me. Well, I got a lot of phone calls. And I remember, well, one farmer that I sent a certified letter to was our own Senator Frank Nolan. And he's got this really deep barreling voice. And he, he said, well, Bobby, I'm protesting this. I want you to come out on my farm and show me where these wetlands are. And so I arrived and he said, Bobby, what's the definition of wetlands? And so I commenced to spew out all my bureaucratic knowledge of the three-part federal definition, which didn't go over too well. And he said, well, Bobby, I'm gonna tell you my definition. And that is, if you can sit down in that wetland and your pants get wet, it's a wetland. So uh, that was my lesson in, in how to, uh, not spew out bureaucratic definitions of, of uh, wetlands. And let me screen share again. I'm gonna show you another picture. There's the Lorax. Back in, in the 80s, uh, we, uh, soil conservation has used the, this slide rule. This is actually my slide rule that I used. <laughs> Uh, when we go out on farmland and on highly erodible annual cropland to determine whether a farmer uh, met the provisions of the farm bill. And so if, if uh, a farmer had too much soil erosion, they had to change their ways. And the, the, in the process of passing the 1985 farm bill, uh, I remember the debate very well. The environmentalists had the position, well, why should we have any soil erosion on annual cropland, highly erodible cropland, if they were going to get USDA benefits? And of course, the farmers were on the other end of the spectrum. They didn't want any regulation at all. And so Congress, in their infinite wisdom, compromised. And to this day, farmers can get USDA benefits 
at two times what soil scientists believe is a sustainable level of soil erosion. And so that, that's not a very uh, sustainable formula there. And what I want to end with is a quote from Jane Fonda. She said, activism is the antidote for despair. It's better than Prozac. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. And thank you, Sean. And thank you, Robbie. We still, we have a, uh... We have about 15 minutes for questions and for a dialogue, so we'll open it up to anybody who has any questions for any of our panelists. I have a question. Kristen Riley, you're on. <laughs> um, so for our panelists, um, one question I have for you is if you could tell yourself at 25, one thing about working in this field or your journey through working in the environmental space, what would it have been? Well, I'll start. Um, one of my mentors said to me at the very beginning of my career with the States, focus on the integrity of the program and the project and the money and recognition will follow if you do the job you're expected to do. And in my case, that worked. But so many of my generation wanted to make their first million by the time they were 30. And this fellow said to me, focus on the integrity of the work and the program and the project and everything else will follow. That's good. I think um, if if uh, if I could follow on that, so, so um, I think what I would tell myself is this is something that actually John Page Williams said to me probably ten years ago, and I was just getting into um, you know, activism in the in the Chesapeake, um, and, and you know not really activism, but at least taking a stand for clean water. And he said, Sean, he said that instinct that you have to protect those things that you love the most, that's what you should follow. And, you know, he was talking about fishing because I, you know, I love fishing, I love the bay. The bay was like Disneyland to me at the time because I just, you know, moved up here and I just figured out, this was probably 15 years ago, not 10 years ago. I just figured out that, you know, that I loved fishing here. And yeah, you know, that's, that's what I love. So as a result, I have to fish, you know, that's, that's part of it. I, but if I didn't fish, I wouldn't be doing things like I'm doing here. And so I think, you know, just follow your music, do the things you love, and that will, it just follows naturally uh, that you look out for those things. Thank you, Sean. And I'll just chime in here. I agree with, with Sean and Robbie and, and uh, Sean, I'll share with you. I had a 1964 Ford Falcon. That's what I went to <laughs> drive one. That was a little prettier car than the 63. <laughs> uh, I'd like to add that as a recovering bureaucrat <laughs> that uh, don't, you know, we, we spend too much time on processes and not the product. And, and in our world, pro, you know, the product is clean water. And so many people get wound up in the processes and they lose sight of the product. So in other words, they can't see the forest for the trees. Uh, and and that, that leads to, you know, follow your ethics and, and, and what is right. So I'll end there. Peter, could I add to that? Absolutely. Um, when the 72 Act was passed and I was working at EPA and they were 
Uh, we were working on the regulations and trying to define what was a point source and what was a non-point source and all of the things that we're so comfortable with now. I remember looking at drafts of these draft regulations and clean water and water quality was rarely, if ever, mentioned. There was a lot of bureaucratic rigmarole and you're going to do this and you're going to do that, but there was no correlation to if you did that, would the water be any cleaner? And I don't know that we've moved a whole lot beyond that. What do you think, Bobby? Well, we're still arguing over what, what are the waters of the United States. We've been arguing over that for 40 years. <laughs> yeah. We aren't, they are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another question? So, so I've got a one question. Oh, I'm going to do. I have a question. I'm going to do an anecdote and a question. So, um, <laughs> to establish my codger bona fide with everyone else, my first car was a 1963 Studebaker, <laughs> made in South Bend, Indiana, Pete Buttigieg's hometown. Um, <laughs> also, going back in the past, I, I started. I came down to DC in 1987. Um, from Rhode Island to work for a congresswoman from Rhode Island on the what used to be the Merchant Marine and Fisheries Committee in the House of Representatives. Um, and she was Republican. I was a Republican House Committee staffer. And the very first vote in 1987 in the new 100th Congress was overriding President Reagan's veto of the 1987 amendments to the Clean Water Act. That was the very first thing. It was H.R. 1, I remember. One. It really. Mm -hmm. um, and it was kind of odd for me because I was brandy spanking new and all these people I was working with, they had gone through this war of, the, you know, doing the Clean Water Act amendments in 87. And I was like, eh, just, just do the override vote. It was like nothing. Um, yeah. But my point is that was Reagan's veto was overridden by a huge coalition of Democrats and Republicans in the House and the Senate. I worked for a Republican House member whose profession that she put on her um, income tax form was environmentalist before she was a congresswoman. Um, that's what she focused on. And we've had a lot of champions, you know, even in our region. I mean, the, the, the whole Chesapeake Bay restoration was really led at the federal level by um, Senator Mac Mathias, a Republican senator from Maryland. Um, you know, not that long ago, Senator um, John Warner, Republican in Virginia was a staunch supporter of the Bay and clean water and a lot of environmental issues. And we, and it's not that there are no Republicans left that are, you know, that are very supportive, but it's, it's become a partisan issue seemingly, um, especially at the federal level. Just wanted to ask every, you know, all the panelists, do you see a way of changing this or how do we get out of this? Um, it, it's just become so polarized, like so many things, but this has become a polarized issue, which never used to be. Well, I want to thank you for the, your work you did with Claudine Schneider. Um, she was a very interesting member of Congress, and she and I uh, led the delegation, the North American delegation, to the Global Assembly for Women and the Environment. And... Um, I'll never forget one of, the, one of the questions to the two of us that shut us right up was, um, you Americans, this was down in Miami, you Americans talk about the environment, uh, but we live in it and we work in it. And um, where do you get off consuming the majority of the energy and the resources of the world and still preach to us about the environment? And she took that very seriously and came back and did. I think you got tasked with some of that work, Peter. Um, and so, yeah, we need, we need the Republican uh, folks to go back to where they started. But I don't know. Chris, are you hopeful? Um, I'm, I'm not very hopeful for a while unless uh, we just overrun them with uh, activism and public involvement. We need to get rid of Citizens United and yeah. campaign fixed campaign finance. That's really at the heart of it. We're not going to win anything until we kick that stuff to the curb. 
So yeah, I agree with that, and and um, yeah, I agree. Yeah, and, and so do I. But so my take on this is that you know there's there are people, uh, and, and Robbie is one, and, and Bobby too, who have you know dedicated their lives to to uh, kind of the grand scale of things, but my you know they say all politics is local and i and i think that's uh, that's true when it comes to environmental issues in the fishing community i mean we're a conservative lot not me personally but uh, you, you know when you take a look at social media and stuff oh my goodness it's um, it, it's, it's it's they're very conservative but what we all have in common is clean water they can't we can't fish if the water's not clean and so you kind of just keep pounding on them uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm planning to do that today is just, you know, get on social media and start talking about, hey, if we don't have clean water, you can't go out there and go fishing. And then I think that eventually that has to trickle up a little bit. I don't know how much, but uh, at least I, that's my hope. Thanks, Sean. And boating and kayaking and paddling yeah. of all kinds. And yeah. Uh, yeah, you had another question, Peter. Did you see a nice young lady? Oh, that was Kate. Hey, Fritz. Kate, you're on. Sorry. <laughs> no worries, Peter. Um, uh, so much right now is changing, even in the last 30 days, obviously. And we've, um, you know, one, one of the speakers alluded to kind of the um, positive th effects we're seeing in our air quality and our water quality. Um, if there's one thing that, um, you know, as, as kind of the, the new crop of leaders, coming into the Chesapeake Bay movement, if you could leave us with one thing that's really helping us look forward in terms of lessons you've learned or things, to Kristen's point, with you know, things you wish you'd told yourself uh, or you knew when you were 25, um, what, what should we prioritize and, and, and look to do as um, you know, we, we help move the next 50 years ahead for our movement? Well, for me, I would say um, network, 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 make sure that uh, you include instead of exclude. I know when um, Hayes uh, created the Earth Day Network and whatnot, there were, um, well, you stay on your side of the fence and we'll stay on ours. And um, a number of the organizations didn't exist. Uh, but as they came online, it, there were turf issues in between. And uh, there was a lot of money for wastewater treatment, $5 billion a year. There was a lot of scrambling like there is now for stimulus money. Um, and the only way that we were successful was to go beyond our, um, our own little backyard and work with the forest industry, the animal agriculture industry, um, even the chemical industry and the petroleums, and, and that doesn't feel comfortable for a lot of environmentalists, but you got to go to the polluters because they're the ones that have to make the change. And um, to think we're above that uh, might feel good for our egos, but it doesn't get the job done. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and to add to that, Kate, I would say two things. Number one, diversity. Uh, whenever... I was protesting the Teleco Dam back in 1976. It was an all white crowd and completely. There are no African Americans, no Hispanics, no, nothing else. Now on our Earth Day celebrations that we'll see today, it's gonna to be a little different. So we're making progress in that regard, but we got a long way to go. And I know that you you share that passion and I, and I appreciate that. And speaking of passion, that's the second part of the equation is to appeal to where to appeal to people where their passions are. Find out the things they love and tell them what you're doing to improve those things they love. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question if anybody has anything. I have one. Yeah. What are you gonna be doing for Earth Day? <laughs> mm. Me personally? Anybody. Planting trees. <laughs> Yeah. How many trees have you planted, Bobby? I don't know. <laughs> you know, when I retired in 2009, I think we were at 
a half a million. <laughs> wow. wow, that's amazing. I it was something like that. Hey, Bobby, I got one quick question for you. Did, are you seeing, I mean, you've obviously done a lot of work with your riparian buffers and, and all your all those things that you're doing to improve your streams. Are you seeing any of your neighbors participating in that now? Are they coming along? Well, slowly, slowly, but you know, it's, uh, you know, my personal opinion, we're never gonna uh, get over the 60% the bell curve uh, without going beyond voluntary BMPs. We're gonna have to do a little more. Yeah. yeah. I, I, People aren't just going to do it. This is Stan Watkins. I have a question for you, Bobby. I, I, am I on? You're on. You're on, Stan. We can hear you. So well, the thing that I've never understood is why farmers don't l jump on this, on the CREP program, where they can actually, in many instances, make more money by putting their land or their buffers in CREP rather than, than farming it. And um, it's just been inconceivable to me why, why this program hasn't been more popular and why it doesn't have more political support. Well, that's, a, that's the uh, $64,000 question. Good question. Uh, and I can tell you that there are many reasons. Uh, you know, fear of government, you know, regulation, uh, they've always done it this way but to to really get over the hump <clears throat> and and i will say that we have continuously improved the programs with rearranging the incentives and everything like that but we still it's more to it than just putting in the bmps the farmer is the one left with the maintenance and the Alliance and several other organizations have got this, these wonderful programs to help with uh, the maintenance. And I think the new farm bill has put some, you know, more provisions in there for maintenance, but it's still, uh, you know, in most cases, we're asking the farmer to put in twice as much fence as they have now. And, and, and they have to maintain all those fences. So it is a little more work, even though we, we conservationists, you know, we can say that there are umpteen advantages to, you know, getting the cows in the barn easier and so forth and so on. Uh, but the, the mindset out there that I've heard many times is that I'm not going to do it unless you make everybody do it. That might be the gist of it. I'm, I'm interested in the Chesapeake wildlife heritage, and we've put together a couple farms where, you know, the, the using crep, you know, and changing the environment totally, and, it, and for actually for wildlife, both, uh, you know, rabbits and quail and critters, as, as well as uh, waterfowl. And it's, it makes a huge difference in uh, the quality of water that runs off these farms. Oh, it does, definitely. I even heard one, one farmer told me years ago, he said, Bobby, since we put these buffers in, that's where the groundhog goes. Mm. That's where the groundhogs live. And so, you know, I've improved my pastures by not <laughs> having groundhog holes. <laughs> so add that to the list of the advantages. Mm. <laughs> right. No, no, uh, no buffers in Punkultani, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much, Sean, Robbie, and Bobby. Thank you tremendously. This was this was fantastic. Um, and Robbie, also to answer your question about my plans for Earth Day, I think they changed. I may go gudgeon fishing if uh, I get some more. <laughs> One, one quick thing. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Uh, right in the chat, I'm uh, putting in the information for another presentation that Kate Fritz is actually presenting as we speak. So if you have the time, uh, feel free to jump onto that. And we have other um, presentations and sessions throughout the day. So, uh, but thank you again to- Thank to you Sean. all. This is great. Thank you. Good to see you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Bobby. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>
Thanks for doing this, Kristen, Drew, Peter.